Okay, Rabbi. Yes. Welcome to the Kalba Shul's Model Seder. Welcome, everyone. We're here with Rabbi Tolushkin and myself, Naftali Citron. We're going to be doing the Model Seder together. And uh, we're very excited to be doing that this evening. And we're also looking forward to raising points that you can discuss at your Sidara. Obviously, you all have different uh, things that are striking to you in the various prayers or paragraphs of the Seder. Uh, but we want to add also on some maybe original viewpoints and subjects of the sort that can itself provoke discussion, which is what helps make the Passover Seder uh, so meaningful. Uh, I was actually just sharing with somebody that they were asking questions about the Seder. And I'm like, there are answers to these questions, but the questions actually are more important than the answers. Yes. So yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a night of questions and, and curiosity. And of course, there are also answers, but without the questions, they're not that important. In fact, that's a very significant issue you're raising, uh, Reverend Pauli. And when we get to the Manishtana, which is like the trademark, in many ways, probably the most famous one of the ceremonies, I want to have, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on the significance of questions uh, within, uh, within Judaism, which I think uh, marks it off as in some ways uh, quite unique. Definitely a, a, an amazing, an amazing night, the Seder. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yes, the Manishtana is really a very, very different type of thing than what we used to. So you mentioned, Rabbi Tolushkin, that we would start with the order of the Seder. Yes, let's do that. Maybe call me Reb Joseph. Reb I'm Joseph. You, Reb <laughs> okay. 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 Great. Uh, and in case you don't know, Reb Joseph, or widely known as Rabbi Joseph Tolushkin, has uh, authored about 20 books, many of them standard books in, in, in every Jewish household. And it's just a, it's a great honor and a great privilege. We usually actually do the Seder together in person. Obviously last year, we couldn't do it because of COVID. This, this year, we almost got together. Next year, we're gonna do it together. Got a really good person right. right here, right in this room. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things about Manishtana, why is this year different? It's not just this year. But why are things happening in the world? A lot of people are wondering, why me? Why this? What, what's going on? So maybe we'll include that in our Seder of right. things that are going on in our lives and, and, and in the world right now that are, that are different than what we're used to. Mm -hmm. Kind of unexpected. So we'll start with that, with the Kaddish. Okay. So it's on, I'm using the uh, Arts Girl Family Haggadah. That's the show happens to use. It's a convenient Haggadah. It doesn't... Doesn't really have commentary, which is good. <laughs> so I, we'll we'll do the commentary. We will invite yeah. like you to participate in your own family, Sadara. Yeah. Uh, because we have a limited amount of time, so we can't make this uh, interactive. But we're hoping we'll be interactive and enable you all who watch this to have your own interactive Sadara. So if Natalia is starting, you know, the word Seder really is means order. And there are 15 steps in the Seder, and Naftali is going to mention all of them, and then a few we might have some comments about. So I'll read them all in Hebrew, and then we'll translate them. Kadesh Urchatz Karpas Yachatz Magid Ratsa Mahotzi Matsa Marar Korech Shokahan Orech Safon bare halel nirza. First, we make kiddush, and we make kiddush every Friday night and every holiday. But uh, actually, this year we can talk a little bit about the fact that Passover begins Saturday night. So, believe it or not, we're actually making kiddush and havdalah on the same cup of wine, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. A whole discussion in the Talmud that usually we don't do bundles of mitzvahs. Right, we're so used to like bundling our work and pleasure all in the same 
time, multitasking. We, we don't like to do that when it comes to mitzvah, but for some reason, Kiddush and Abdel are considered like kind of close enough that it's not considered uh, mm -hmm. disrespectful. Then we wash our hands. We don't normally wash our hands, but we're not eating bread. So that's a question the kids will notice. And then we dip something also out of the ordinary to dip something, vegetable and salt water before we actually begin the meal. By the way, some of these things were done in ancient Palestine and Rome, but we just haven't done them for thousands of years. So it's kind of a curiosity. Mm, yes. yes. In fact, it's worth noting that as far as can be ascertained, the Seder, the Passover Seder, in which we're all now participating, is the oldest continually observed ritual in the world. Wow. And from what I understand, what I can ascertain, it hasn't changed very, very much. So the fact that if we would go back 20 or 30 generations, Jews were gathering together on the first night of Pesach and basically doing what we're doing. And there's something enormously comforting about it because we live in a world that's so filled with innovations. And, you know, just think of the innovations in our lifetime. And if you're getting on in years like I am, I'm 72. There are so many things my children can easily do that I can't easily do. And I remember when I was a kid and there were things my parents found troubling uh, or, or puzzling. I, you know, it's, they seemed a little out of it. So I realized I'm destined to seem a little out of it. But there's something very comforting that we're doing something that Jews have been doing for thousands of years. It's a sense of antiquity and a sense of authenticity. It's funny. I, I actually didn't know that uh, it was the longest continual ritual yeah. that's being observed, but it, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So then um, we, we break the middle matzah because we want to symbolize that we don't even have a full piece of matzah, which is, you know, the question is, is the glass half empty or the half full? And the, and the answer is, well, it was full, but we purposely make it a half. <laughs> the Jewish way. And then, and then we actually have the Magi, we recount the, the story of the Exodus. And I, I sometimes think that's the most important thing. A lot of people think the, uh, the dinner is the most important thing. And, <laughs> and then we wash our hands again. This time we make a mozi on the matzah. And then we have the bitter herbs and the Hillel sandwich, the Koreh, that reminds us of the custom of Hillel to eat the matzah more and in former times of the temple. The actual uh, Pesach offering, which is lamb. I had lamb for dinner, just because, you know, lamb is the best. And then Shulchan Aruch, the, the dinner, and the Sof on the Apikomen, there after the blessing after meal. How well, a very important and sometimes misunderstood, neglected part of the Seder is, is reciting the Halal both before the dinner and after the dinner, and Nirza when we when we uh, say that our prayers are accepted. I'm going to just check up and met, I'm going to admit some more people. Okay. In the room, you could comment on. on so I'm going to comment on something about the Kaddish, which is we inaugurate the meal with the, by chanting the Kiddush, which is a song, of course, over wine. And it's interesting to note that there are tr religious traditions other than Judaism that actually outlaw consumption of intoxicating uh, beverages, like exactly like wine. Islam, Muslims are not supposed to drink wine, and so to speak, uh, to use an odd term for it, so to speak, unkosher for them. Uh, evangelical Christians oppose the consumption of wine. And there are good arguments one can make, certainly drunkenness, the misusage, of liquor can be very devastating. But Judaism has an interesting insight. It says there are things that could go either way. They could be good, they could be bad. And in the effort to make them good, Judaism tries to endow it with holiness. So that, for example, the word for Kiddush comes from the word Kadosh, which means to make something holy. A lot of religious traditions view it as ambivalent sexual relations. Judaism is one of the few religious traditions uh, that says that a person 
has to marry. In many movements, holy people are supposed to be people who utterly refrain from having sexual relations. And so certainly, again, that's the case that we know in Catholicism and in some of the Eastern religions, holy people are assumed to be those who refrain from sex. Years ago, Gershom Shalom, who was considered the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, said that, I think he said Judaism was the only religious tradition with which he was familiar, in which its mystics were also expected to also, to also be married. So here again, what do the rabbis do? When a wedding occurs, they refer to the wedding as kiddushin, which again derives from the word for making something holy. So here we find liquor and sex, two activities that have often led to unholy behavior. And Judaism says when practiced properly lead to holy behavior. And so we inaugurate the Pesach, not only with wine, but with four cups of wine. Let me just hasten to add though, if somebody has a problem with drinking liquor, there is an alternative. Grape juice yeah, that's true. It is as much as it is mandated that people should have four cups of wine, it is no less mandated that people who cannot control their drinking, who are alcoholics, they are mandated to drink grape juice. Uh, because the last thing in the world this holiday wants to lead to is to sickness and to sometimes uncontrollable behavior. But it is interesting, again, when done properly, it becomes kadosh. So we call it kiddush. OK, I promise you all other such comments will be of much shorter duration. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great deep teaching about you know, how we, what Judaism, one of the unique qualities of Judaism, and of course, its connection to, to wine or even grape juice. Mm -hmm. Second best. You can't have it. Uh, but yeah, all right. Okay, then our thoughts, as of course, as Rabbi Naftali explained, it's the washing of the hands. But you want to elaborate for a minute, Naftali? You said step number five, you consider the most important, Maggi. Well, that's because I'm a rabbi. So, you know, <laughs> as rabbis, we like to talk. So, but honestly, most people, there was no dinner. I don't think they just show up for Maggi. So, but but I, I do think that Maggid is um, important because I really, I really believe that the whole experience of searching for the chametz, turning over your kitchen, getting kosher for Passover food, and, and then searching for the, during the badika with the candle and the feather flashlight and, and then making all the special foods, all make the magid more meaningful. I don't think it would have that meaning mm -hmm. if it was just like a holiday where we read these passages without all of the effort to create a culinary experience with evil food for eight days, the chametz right. and this sacred food, the masa, which is almost the same, and, and, and all of the things that we do that, that kind of to me, that that creates the magid, like it creates the space for the magid to to become more real and, and to feel it. And I think what's also true is the rituals in general. Without the rituals, I think Passover would become nothing. And we tend to most remember things when there are rituals. You can even see it from the example of the United States. We know living in the United States, there are a whole number of national holidays. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been changed, not to the date, but to the nearest Monday, so that they <clears throat> can become an extra day off. And then they lose their meaning. So that, for example, if you ask Americans who are basically 60 and over, a group into which I belong, not so much my younger distinguished colleague. Uh, what, da, what is the day of Abraham Lincoln's birthday? Almost everybody will know it's February 12th. Why do they all know it? Because when we were growing up, you got off from school on February 12th. And 10 days later, you got off from school on February 22nd. And those were the dates. But then they changed the law 
and the declared president's day to honor all presidents is the third Monday in February. But what ends up happening, nobody gets honored. It's just another day off from school. The two dates that really matter, and even like on Memorial Day, you don't really have any ceremonies. In Israel, they observe Memorial Day the day before Yom Ha'atzma'ud. And the whole country at a certain point comes to a standstill for two minutes. So it's meaningful. But there are really no Memorial Day observations, even though they actually honor soldiers who died in the wars that America fought. The two days that they don't want to change, and it makes sense. Can you imagine if suddenly in the United States, they would say, oh, Christmas is observed on whatever is the last Monday in February, last month, uh, Monday in December. People would get very, very upset. Christians would get very, Jews would accept this news calmly, but Christians would get understandably very upset because to them it's a sacred day. So that's it. I remember, you know, people, uh, remember making the point once to somebody, if we observe, uh, if, if rabbis got together and decided, you know what, we'll get a bigger attendance in Shul if we make Yom Kippur the first Sunday uh, in October. You know what would end up happening? Uh, very few people would end up coming to shul because the power of a ritual is that you have to conform your life to the ritual. If the ritual is in some ways inconvenient, you conform your life to it. But if the ritual can be changed, anytime it becomes inconvenient, mm -hmm. what you're really saying is that the ritual has no intrinsic significance. Which, which maybe Rabbi Lushkin, Joseph, if I, if I could suggest that the whole kind of problem with Western society's view of religion is to understand it, to mm -hmm. demystify it, and to explain that it's not literal. And, and what we understand there's a problem with fundamentalism, but, but at the same time, there's also a problem when you strip something and once you say it doesn't really, the, the story is a metaphor, that it's no longer actually powerful. Mm -hmm. That it's just a, an idea competing with many other ideas without any application, without any way of, of realizing it and, and tasting it, and then it just gets lost. It's, it's just like a step towards assimilation because intellectualizing things and taking them out of their more concretized context, and unless you are on a very high level, you eventually will lose its practice. There's, it's gotta, you, you, you can't just make it a, member, a concept, an abstraction, so even though we don't want to take things too literally, because you know we, we do have a tradition that interprets, but at the same time we don't want to overinterpret and lose in, in the search for meaning actually end up losing the meaning. Yes. And of course, the point underlying what Rev. Naftali is saying is this: Magi means the television. Every Jew I know who observes Pesach, with the exception of converts, uh, obviously because they only learned about Pesach at a later point in their lives, whenever they had made the decision to convert. But all other Jews don't ultimately know about Pesach from having read books about it. They know about it because from the time they were little kids, they were taught by their parents, who in turn were taught by their parents, who in turn were taught by their parents in an unbroken chain. When I commented earlier, this is the longest observed ritual with which we are familiar, but it really was from generation to generation because they told the story. So if you grew up being Jewish, you were told the story. We were slaves in Egypt and we were liberated from slavery in Egypt. Liberation, freedom should be the right of human beings. And that's part of what it means to be Jewish. We were slaves unto Pharaoh and then we chose and we became servants unto God. And I would fear that if the United States, if there's not enough telling of it, if July 4th, I always wish there was a July 4th Seder that Americans could observe and remember why America became a special country. But if it's reduced to being cooking, you know, hot dogs for the day and it has no deeper meaning, Americans are going to feel less committed to America. So this was a real genius of the rabbis. Okay. okay. Do you want to do any more? Should we, uh... Let's see what are some of the other things. Well, the Maror, again, it's the power of symbolism. It depends what you use. 
What do you like to use from our your um, I I I use uh, freshly ground horseradish. And do you eat enough of it that it really tastes bitter? Oh yeah. If I don't cry, I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't eat as much of it as I should, but it really it, that again, you know, it's the symbolism of something being very bitter, and and not something that one otherwise would want to eat. If one likes the maror and say, hey, you know, this is really good. I'm going to have it throughout the year then they should change their food. It actually should be an unpleasant experience. You're feeling something unpleasant, something that really embitters, which is why when we then go into the uh, chirosis, we do want something sweet in it because the marrow alone is too, uh, is too difficult uh, for us. Okay, I think we pretty much have, have done this. We covered, we covered some of them. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's yeah. always what well, we can always come back as we're actually mm -hmm. going into. So we're, we don't. I didn't really uh -huh. bring the food with me, Joseph. I feel bad. I was going to go. I just koshered my kitchen today, so I didn't have time uh -huh. to actually uh, prepare the food. I, I literally my my oven self cleaning cycle just ended right before I got it. But this is a seder plate everyone and we will have the first cup maybe we'll have two cups of grape juice okay good and i'll just tell everybody a little bit about what you would put on the seder plate um first of all you put three matzos on the bottom actually this is not a seder plate that you want to put on top of three matzos because they're going to crack but um on this seder plate it's got a space here for this row that's the 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 roasted shank bone the, the baits are the bay of the egg, the marar, which is the, the bitter herbs that, that I, I, I put the uh, horseradish, the haroses up there, and the karpas, which I use a potato. Some people use parsley or celery. Or, and then the, the, uh, the chazeris. I guess the, 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 uh, the romaine. So there are different variations of how to kind of uh, put these, these things out there, but that's one of the standards that I just kind of outlined. I think that is, um, just trying to remember if that's the Shulchan Aruch or there, there's different variations of it, but that's definitely one of them. Okay, so that's the Seder plate. And uh, it's good to prepare most of those things uh, this year, tomorrow, or or Friday. Obviously, you could actually cook on Yumtif, but it, you don't want to have to do that in the first Seder because it's... No, you definitely you want to rush. have... You, yeah, right. You definitely yeah. want to have your Seder plate uh, ready. Yeah, and, and, and even like the Harosas is... It's, it, it's hard to make it on, on Yumtif. You want to just make that beforehand. So, um, so the first thing we do is we make Kiddush. I'm not gonna. We'll make kiddush and then we recline. Um, yes, because we're sitting in the Karlbach shul and we didn't bring pillows with us, we actually are supposed to recline, indicating that we're like men and for that women, women of great luxury. So we can just recline and eat in a very relaxed position at the seder in the style of people who are free. And you know, last year was the first year that I literally said, I always want to recline on a couch, but you can't do that here. Right. But because of COVID, we didn't have Seder. I had to say it at the first night Seder on my own. So I actually took a little table and I reclined on the couch. Mm -hmm. Still, I, I, I'd rather go back to the chair. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we'll make the Sabrim Ranan, Rabbanan, Rabbosai. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam borei priyagafen. Amen. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem elokin melech haolam asher b'chavanu b'kolam. Baruch atah Hashem Amen. for the fire. 
המעביר בין כל השלכות, בין הלכו של אבן ישראל לעם, אם הוא משווי את השש הזה מהמעשה, אין קדושה שעבס לקדושה סיימת והגדלת, ואז אם משווי את השש הזה מהמעשה, קידשת, הגדלת בגלל שזם פיסה בקדושה שכה, ברוך אתה השם, המעביר בין כל השלכות אש, ברוך אתה השם אלוקינו מלך העולם, שהחיינו וכי עמנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. אמן. Rabbi Naftali sang it as a, as a, <laughs> right, don't fall over. Rabbi Naftali actually defined it properly, which is why he didn't use God's actual name, uh, which is why we say Hashem. I almost did. <laughs> right. For educational purposes, you might be able to. But... No, but I want to say, for actually, for purposes of our now drinking the wine, the Bori Kriyagapim, we really should say. Yes. I did, uh, I did, because independent yeah. of the Kiddush, if on any given day, if you decide to drink wine or grape juice, so it's Baruch Atah and I am Cholam Borei Priyagat. Oh, don't forget to recline. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, that's, that's a model. Side, if you see, Naftali and I both fall over, <laughs> which might be the case if this was actually yeah, wine. Wine is a big, big glass of wine. Yeah. But luckily, it's not. So that's the kiddush. You'll notice. If you're watching this in some future time, this might not be the Kiddush for the particular year that you're in. This year, when Passover is on Saturday night, we add in the Havdal. We make Kiddush first, and within that framework of Kiddush, we then say the Havdalah for differentiating between Shabbos and the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. So it, it is quite an interesting thing that I sometimes feel like there are two calendars almost in contradiction with one another, one of the week mm -hmm. and one of the, uh, the, 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 month, the day of the month. And that bothered some people so much that there was a split in Judaism over our calendar. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Book of Jubilees and if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a sect of Jews who believed that the, the, the day of the month had to fall on a particular day of the week. Mm -hmm. And the Talmud alludes to it. It doesn't, it doesn't quite spell out the way it's... So what did they do? They had to like talk through the calendar? So they had to... Oh, well, they were always in fights with the rabbis. They, they hate, you know, it's yeah. like they always... There's a, who do you hate? The, the person that's closest to you, but not exactly you. So they, right. they were Jewish, but at, and at some points they may have had control of the temple and, and, the, and the rabbis fought with them over control of, of the temple, of the priesthood, and of the calendar. Really. So it's kind of one of those leftover things. I can see why they don't like the symmetry. They want it to, to just fit yeah. in. So then, of course, you have to fit in. Well, they, they were all by one day, 360, they had a 364 day in your calendar. Eventually, that would get out of whack. Oh, of course. Yeah. Get out of yeah. Whack. You know what it is? The Jewish calendar is what's called the lunar calendar. It's based on the moon. And that calendar really is only 354 days. And there is a group that still observes the lunar calendar, which is, of course, Muslims. And that's why every year, uh, Ramadan. Ramadan falls it's moving, days it's earlier. It's moving around. Yeah. 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 And that's what would have happened to Judaism. But you know what stopped it from happening to Judaism? The fact that the Torah makes it clear that Passover has to fall during the spring. Yeah. So the Jews correct for it. It's, it will get too complicated if I explain how they correct it for it. They had we had leap years that they added on days. They actually yeah. added on the whole month, whole month, every yeah. every few years, and that's why we had to do it because otherwise we would have been in the same situation yeah. that the uh, that the Muslims were in. But obviously Ramadan didn't have to fall during a particular season in the way that Passover does. So Naftali, I think it's fair to say. That there are three different kiddushes that can be observed to Passover. This year is a relatively rarer one because it doesn't usually happen that the Seder, first mm -hmm. Seder is on a Saturday yeah. night. Yeah. And so, what makes this kiddush different? That could have been a question in the four <laughs> questions. Why is this kiddush? Why is this kiddush different? Because it also includes the Havdalah prayer, the prayer that is mm -hmm. normally recited to conclude the Shabbat. More often. Then uh, this, uh, the first Seder is held on a Friday night. So then, in addition to the Kiddush of Yom Tov, you add on the Shabbat, the regular Shabbat Kiddush, 
And most frequently of all is when a kiddush falls during one of the weekdays, and then you make the very special yanto kiddush. Mm. Yeah, which is right. Which you is got different. three, so three different ways of making kiddush. Yeah. So already, like the second night, the second seder, you won't have any havdalah because it's a Sunday night. So it's it'll Saturday be a shorter seder, uh, shorter kiddush. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now we'd wash our hands, and then we would take the. Um, the carpas, right, the potato, and you dip it into salt water, and we'd make the blessing, Baruch Atah Hashem Alokein Melech Olam, Baruch Biyadama, I'm eating the imaginary carpas, some people recline for carpas. Okay. Rabbi, why salt water? It's a good, you know what, I, I think it tastes better, although my doctor says I should go a little easy on the salt. Right, but what do you say? Was it? Is that well, it's supposed to symbolize the uh, the cries of the slaves. Mm -hmm. You always think of the salt water symbolizing their cries. But here again, what's mandatory is the eating of the vegetable. So again, if somebody is on a strict salt, no salt diet, this is not something they should do. Uh, but I always understood it as symbolizing the tears of slaves. Yeah, I, I would say if if you're on a no salt diet, you could actually just dip it in water because part of it is doing something different, and mm -hmm. and obviously, you know, we want to conform when we can, but we want to do what's best for us when we really know what we can and can't do. So health is number one, mm -hmm. uh, but but a lot of times there's something we can do. Like for example, you mentioned. If you cannot drink wine because you have a problem with alcohol and you get sick from it, we have an alternative, we have grape juice. Or even for people who can drink wine, but feel that four cups of wine is just too much, then you could mix grape juice and wine. You could even mix, in the Talmud they used to put in uh, four, three or four uh, uh, times the amount of wine diluted with water. Either because the wine was awful or right. I just didn't want to get that drunk. Uh, and it was a different style. I think there were, in the ancient world, the Greeks would often water down their wine and mm -hmm. they considered people who drank straight wine barbarians. Wow. Now it's the opposite. If you know anyone who pours seltzer into their wine, they're like some fool, you know, yeah. like some simpleton. Yeah, it was the opposite in former times. So I'm yeah. just going to tell one, sh one short story here and then we'll, we'll, we'll pass yes. up. Uh, but it's an irrelevant and interesting story. And it's about one of the Gedolim, one of the great, one of the really great Jews who we lost this past year, Abraham Tversky. Tversky was, of course, a Hasidic Jew and also a psychiatrist. And he devoted much of his life to the fight against addictions and particularly started with alcoholic addiction. And Tversky tells the following story. I heard him tell it and it's in his books. He was the attending uh, psychiatrist at St. Francis Hospital, a Catholic hospital in Pittsburgh, where they all respected him as, as a rabbi as well. And there was a priest there who had been admitted for alcoholic, alcoholic addiction. And a nurse reported to Tversky that the priest kept asking for excessive amounts of mouthwash. And anybody who knows mouthwash knows that it has a significant alcoholic content. And anybody who's ever tasted mouthwash knows that anybody who's drinking it for its alcoholic uh, content is very addicted because mouthwash does not taste very good. So Tversky went to the priest and he said, Father, we're going to release you one of these days and you're going to die because of the amount of alcohol you're drinking. You can't sustain it. So the, tourist, so the priest said, what can I do? He said, I want to put you on something called antabuse. Antabuse is something that when you take it, mm. if you then consume any alcohol at all, you get so sick mm. that that will stop you from taking it. The priest said, can I take a little wine? Tversky said, you cannot take any whatsoever. So the priest said, I can't do it. Tversky said, why not? He said, because then I won't be able to administer the mass, mm. because at the end of the mass, the mm. priest takes some wine. Tversky, thinking like an Orthodox Jew, said, "Same as grape juice." <laughs> the priest said, "We're not allowed." 
First he pulled up, I'm forgetting the man's name, the man Moshe who was Einstein. Then, <laughs> <laughs> right. La he, the other one. Yeah. He called up uh, Cardinal Wright, who was then yeah. the Cardinal in Pittsburgh, who was then at the Vatican. And he said, Father, you have to give dispensation to this mm -hmm. priest to be able to use grape juice. And he said, I can't do that on my own. And a few days later, the Pope, I forget which Pope it was then, issued a ruling that recovering alcoholics could use grape juice. I mentioned this once to my friend, Ari Goldman, who had worked for 20 years on the Times. He was the only person the Times ever hired that the proviso even have to work on Shabbat or holidays. And he laughed. He said, I remember writing that article. And I remember when I wrote it, thinking it sounded like a halakhic ruling. So exactly. again, you know, the fact that in the fact that thousands of years ago, when I don't think people really knew about alcoholic addiction, that the rabbis had already introduced, and you can also use grape juice, I find very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we, we now, we break the middle matzah, and uh, many people have the custom to take the bigger half and break it into further smaller pieces. Some people break it into five pieces, wrap it up in uh, cloth or, or paper towel and, and put it away. And sometimes the children will take that. That's, that's the Atikoman and then you have to mm -hmm. negotiate its release. Uh, and, um, and then we would lift up the broken matzah that we, not the part that's gonna be eaten later as the Atikoman. And we would begin with Helach Ma'anya which goes like this, Helach Ma'anya. I'm not going to read everything in Hebrew, but I want, to, I want to give the first paragraph of the song that my grandfather and Shlomo learned from their father, you mentioned, right? who learned it from his great-grandfather going back maybe a thousand years, this, this tune. Wow. Wow. It's an ancient Ashkenazic tune. Helach Ma'anya, Yach Lavasana Ba'ar de this is the brother of affliction that our forebears ate in the land of Egypt. Who is hungry? Let him come and join us and eat. Who is needy? Let him come and celebrate Pesach together. Now we are here. Next year, we may we be in the land of Israel. Now we are slaves. Next year, may we be free people. By the way, if you want to have any discussion about it, or you want to add something to the discussion with other people who aren't necessarily present to hear this, it's interesting to say it speaks of one who was hungry and then it speaks of one who was needy. So is this sort of like a poetic synonym? They're basically the same thing, or is there a difference? And I won't go into all the details of it, but Agnon, who was an Israeli writer who actually won the Nobel Prize in Literature, the only person who ever won the Nobel Prize in Literature for his writings in Hebrew, wrote a short story to demonstrate the difference between the hungry and the needy. Mm -hmm. He describes a poor shamus in a shul, a sort of assistant in a shul, who after the uh, prayers on the first night of the holiday, goes home to a house that he has the bare minimum. He's really a poor man. He is hungry. Mm. While walking home, he runs into a wealthy widow whose husband had died the previous year and who out of habit had just set the Passover table as, uh, as she usually did. And she invites this poor man to come and, and celebrate Passover with her and they get along very well. And the point of the matter is there are two types of people. There are those who are hungry out of real poverty and there are those who are needy because they're mm -hmm. all alone. Lo to be the It's not good for a person to be alone. And so it reminds us that they're not just synonyms. The hungry and needy are two different types of people. What they do have in common is they both need something from other people. Mm. Interesting questions here, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, now we are going to turn, I believe, Rabbi Nostali, are we now about to turn to, to the, the Yes, yes. While I was there, admitting some people from the waiting room, I 
couple of interesting questions. One was, what do I do? What does somebody do who doesn't believe in God or the story of the, you know, the, the Exodus? So I don't know, maybe you'll tackle that later. <laughs> At some point, not now, let's, let's do the Manashtana. Okay. That could be the fifth question. Okay. okay. You know. So uh, I'll, I'll read that as well. At this point, the Seder plate is removed. It doesn't make such a drastic statement now because it would just be the equivalent of like, like if it would be here with the matzah, I kind of push it aside. Okay. But in, the, in, the, in, the, in olden times, they would have little tables that they would be reclining on couches and they'd have little, little mini tables we brought with them. So they would literally take the tables away. So it made a much right. bigger statement. So and that's all again. So the children should ask. So the, the manishana, manishana, halaylaze, mikol halaylos, mikol halaylos, mikol halaylos, anochim, chameitz umatza, halaylaze, halaylaze, kula umatza, halaylaze, halaylaze, kula umatza. And all the nights of the year we eat chameitz matza, but on this night only matza. Shibachol, Halilos, Anoklin, Shah Yurakos, Halailaz, Halailaz, Maharor, Halailaz, Halailaz, Maharor. All of the nights we eat many vegetables, one this night we only eat Marar, Shibachol, Halilos, Inanu, Mapilin, Afilu Pamechas, Afilu Pamechas, Halailaz, Halailaz, Shitek, Amin. On all other nights, we do not dip even once, but on this night, we dip twice. Shevachol halelos anochlin. Ben yoshvinu, ben misubin. Ben yoshvinu, ben misubin. Halaylazeh, halaylazeh, kulon, no misubin. All of the nights of the year, we eat sitting or reclining, but on this night, we all eat reclining. So those are the four questions. Okay. Uh, you're right. We've been speaking a lot about things. So, you know, I've, I've often I'll just say some, questions. About I'll say something you. very brief about it. This is probably the most famous prayer, so to speak, you know, in the in the Haggadah, and almost everybody knows it because if you were raised at all in a traditional home, this was probably the first time you ever spoke in public. Obviously, we all speak to our parents. But this is the first, you know, and often people had large sadarim. And I know a lot of attention was paid to get a little boy or a little girl. And it was always very exciting when they knew how to say it. And it occurred to me that I bet some of the famous Jewish performers, probably their first public appearance of a Barbara Streisand or a Bette Midler, or remember the singer Neil Sedaka? You know, when I was a kid, I didn't know Neil Sedaka was Jewish. I figured it didn't sound like a Jewish name. And then once in an interview, he said, yes, my name is based on the Hebrew word for charity. Mm. So his name really was Neil Sedaka. And so that's probably their first performance. And it's interesting that it starts with questions. This typifies Judaism. My friend Dennis Prager on his radio show was once asked by a caller, very respectfully, a woman who is clearly a pious Muslim, why are you not a Muslim? Mm. And he said, well, I'll give you one reason. Obviously, probably the main reason is he was born Jewish. Most of us tend to say the religion we're born, but he's a very passionate Jew. He said one reason is the word Muslim means submission. The word for Judaism, uh, for Jews, Yehud, uh, uh, oh God, it's, uh, Yehudi. You know, you know, but it's uh, oh God, what's the Israel. word? With, yeah, Israel. The word Israel derives from, you know, to uh, struggle with God. So he said, that is, Judaism really starts with questions. Think about it. What, what's the first thing that God ever is quoted as saying, uh, in speaking to a human being in the Bible, Ayeka, where are you? God asks a question. Now, obviously, God knew where Adam was hiding. So he asked the question to induce an effect on him. Abraham is depicted in the Bible as asking God a very provocative question. Will not the judge of all the earth act with justice? There's a question, you know, that Jews have often asked. It's quite quoted in Jeremiah. It's quoted in the Psalms. 
where when something very terrible happens, we also, we challenge God with it. We're not told to just swallow it. You can challenge God. And even after you challenge God, you're still then going to go to shul uh, because a question doesn't lead to the end of your affiliation, but it, it strives to be realistic. And I remember once reading an interview in the New York Times with Isidore Rabbi. Rabbi grew up on the Lower East Side and a journal, and he won the Nobel Prize in, uh, I think, in physics. And a journalist once asked him, he said, uh, why did you go into the sciences? Most of the other kids who were with you in elementary school in the Lower East Side probably did this. Yeah, the Shmata Right. And if they said Shmatas, or if they were able to go to college, you know, maybe they became doctors Water. or lawyers. Water. He said, I'll tell you what influenced me. My mother influenced me without even intending it, perhaps. But whenever I come home from school, all the other kids' mothers would say, oh, so what did you learn today? And my mother, interesting, mm. said, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? Mm. And uh, Naftali and I know from going uh, to yeshivas, asking a good question was something that you were congratulated for. My daughter Naomi, when she went to college, you know, befriended a bunch, obviously, of other kids there, many of whom were related, raised in other religious traditions. And there was a young man who became a friend of hers. And he was curious to see the day school she had attended, SAR. And the school allowed her to come in, you know, with her friend. And they sat in on a class with the uh, rabbi, uh, who was the principal of the school. And after the class, Naomi said, was anything striking to you? And he said, yeah. He said, I went to a Catholic high school and the priest would come in and teach us about Catholicism. And you were simply not allowed. You would, it was, would have been shocking if somebody asked a really challenging question to the faith. And here, the principal would make a statement and kids would argue with him. And you know, it created a very different sort of environment. So it's so interesting that kids are not being told just to accept everything on faith that from the earliest age if something strikes them as unreasonable they're allowed to ask it now fortunately all these questions really do have you know very good rational answers and some of the questions we raised don't all have answers but the famous there's a famous statement that, you know that's known in the yeshiva world nobody ever died from a question so you don't have to restrain your questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I think this is an important aspect of the Manishtana. Yeah, that is, really is. I mean, one of the things that that's unique to the Seder, but really, really should be about all of Judaism, and sometimes is, is, this, is this idea that you need to have a desire for something instead of it just being kind of force fed. Oh, yeah. If, if uh, one of the things I, I tell people is my son uh, is very into Torah study and into prayer. And I take credit for the prayer that I didn't, not that I take credit that he prays beautifully because I somehow did something for them to pray. Mm -hmm. but I don't take credit for that. I take credit for not forcing him to pray. Mm. Because when he was young, he was very like rambunctious and he would come to shul and he didn't want to pray that much. He wanted to pray just a little bit and then run around and enjoy himself like kids do. And maybe somebody told me about, you know, he's your son, he doesn't look good. He's, he's not four years old anymore. He's already eight or nine, 10. Maybe you should like enforce. I, I said, look, I I don't believe you force children to pray. Mm -hmm. Because prayer is like the manashtana. Prayer mm -hmm. is a question. If you don't have a question, you don't beat the question out of somebody. Mm -hmm. And you don't give them an answer because there's no answer without a question. Right. Prayer is kanha ben shao. Here the son or your daughter asks a question to the Rabbi Shalom, why is this happening to me? Or can, can you help me out here? And without that desire, it's not even, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is bakasha. Bakasha means I'm asking. 
there's part of prayer is praise and part of prayer is thanks, but the essence of prayer is the bakasha is kan ben shao. Here the son or the daughter asks of God something. I think that's beautiful. And by the way, Naftali highlighted a very important thing. It sometimes can be very hard to be the child of a clergyman, of a rabbi, uh, because people make demands of you yeah. and make demands of the parent. It's hard to be a role model. Yeah, I can. And, uh, you know, I once very read uh, something that uh, President Obama made the point. He said something to the effect I don't envy anybody who's the child of the president. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, think about it, mean things that people have said of opposing parties, they'll mock, you know, they'll mock the child. Mm -hmm. And it was very moving when some fun was being poked at uh, Aaron Trump, that the person who stepped to his, among the people who stepped to his defense was somebody who certainly was not an admirer of Aaron Trump's father, was Chelsea Clinton. Mm -hmm. Said, leave the kid alone. He has the right to its childhood. Mm -hmm. And it should be true of rabbis. I know many rabbinic uh, kids of rabbis who it was a it was a very bad part of their childhood that these expectations uh, were unfairly made of them. And I'm very impressed with what Naftali said about his son, who's grown up actually to be a very very impressive uh, young rabbi himself. And it, you know, it, people have to be fair. Yeah. I mean, each each child is like a world unto themselves. So it's it's almost like, on the other hand, some children you gotta make them do it, otherwise they'll never do anything. So it's it's a trait, you know. It, it, it's it's knowing just enough, and and it's and sometimes it's beyond. It's not in our hands, you know. Yeah. We 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 take upon ourselves more than we should because we think right. that it's it's every person is their own person at the end of the day. We just have to do our part, and our part is only a little part of it. It's a mystery. Yeah. So sometimes all we need to do is do some things at the Seder so the kid asks. Where the kid goes with that, that's that's, that, that's you know, that's their choice. Now, Tali also is alluding to something else, that there are a lot of fun things done at the Seder. The rabbis were very explicit. They wanted kids to enjoy the Seder and look forward to it. Yeah. Give them you know, the, the whole menhag. You give them the candy, nuts, yeah. you, you give them the opportunity to perform uh, with the Manishtana, which is very exciting for them. Uh, and for that matter, you know, one of the highlights for children is, and keeps them up, is the stealing of the Apikomen. Uh, and then yeah. they're expected to get, and they expect to get some sort of reward. You know, and obviously you always have cynical people who will say, this is ridiculous, you reward kids for stealing, you know. But everybody knows Some it's a game. People also. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but it's a game. I remember yeah. when I spent a year in Eretz Yisrael, I was learning at a yeshiva. They came around looking for people who volunteered to lead the Seder at a prison. Mm -hmm. And that was a serious thing in Israel because remember, or for those of you who don't know this, for a variety of reasons not worth getting into, there was only one Seder in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, in the United States, obviously, we observe two Sadara. So we can imagine somebody here, you know, willingly giving up their Seder. But if you were in Israel and you volunteered to leave the Seder, that ended it. So they were looking like for American kids who were, who could speak Hebrew, who were uh, Jewishly knowledgeable. So he led the Seder in a prison. And I remember he told me one funny thing. Uh, the warden made one announcement before the Seder. There is no stealing of the Alpi Covenant <laughs> with requests for ransoms. That's good. Yeah. That would be uh, the, a movie of an Israeli prison escape. <laughs> right. All we demand right. that we will be released mm -hmm. or we will, we will well, hurt this Alpi Covenant. Yes. We'll do right. We'll destroy the Alpi Covenant. Okay. okay. So the Seder plate is returned. And if you're wondering why, it's to make you wonder why. And, and we read, you know, I'll read it in English unless, unless no, you know no, that's fine. You can do it. Mm -hmm. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God took us out from there with a, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. And if God, the Holy One, blessed be he, didn't take our forebears out of Egypt, 
us and our children and our grandchildren would continue to be enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. And even if we're wise and understanding and, and, and um, scholars, and we, and we know the Torah, there's, in other words, you might think this is only for uh, simple people or children. It's still a mitzvah to talk about the Exodus and whoever increases and, and talks more about it is praiseworthy. And then we talk about a story with, to, to, as if to prove the point. Uh, it's a story taken from the Talmud from Brachot with Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yehoshua, Rabbi Elizabeth and Azariah, and Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Tarfan. Of all of those names, probably the one we're most familiar with is Rabbi Akiva. And they were gathered in B'nai Brak, now a very religious neighborhood, but apparently it was then too. And they were talking about the Exodus all night until their students came and said, our masters, it's time to recite the morning Shema. And I'll say one more because it's connected. Uh, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, who was one of the assembled sages, says, I was like 70 years old. He actually wasn't 70. He was appointed at the to be the Nasi to replace Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel because of some internal politics at the age of I believe, 17. Yeah. But he was wise like 70 years old. The Los Chisi, and maybe he did live, maybe this he said this later. No, um, no, the, the, the rabbi said it was 17 or 18, and the rabbi is claiming that hair. his hair turned white he over. He prayed, night. he prayed that he, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. And um, he, he never merited to find a, a, a source that you have to recite the Exodus on a nightly basis until he heard the expand, expounding of another sage named Ben Zelma and quoting the verse in, in Deuteronomy that says, in order that you remember the day you left Egypt, all the days of your life. And he says, the days of your life, that, that would mean you should say it every day, but all is like the way he understood it, it was an extra word, the rabbis, find meaning in any word. It's not just extra, it's seen as giving us an imperative to do something, learn something out from. So he's understood that to mean halelos, to recite the Exodus every evening. The sages, on the other hand, said, no, the days of our life is going on this lifetime. All the days of our life is to include the time of the Messiah. So there's a lot there. We'll start with Rabbi Tolishkin on that. I'm going to go to the next one. Oh, you want to go to the next yeah. one? Okay, great. Um, no, I don't think I have anything. Stuck so I'll say, I'll say something there. Something. Um, I, I, that was actually something I talked about last year. I did a Shabbos uh, Haggadol uh, Drasha on ah. it virtually because we weren't meeting. Right, yeah. Which is, by the way, such a crazy thing, right? Last year, if you remember, just this time last year, there were sirens, ambulances going by every day. And then what was it, seven o'clock, everybody would, would bang on the- Yeah, we should go outside to celebrate the, the hospital board. The, the, the hospital, because they were risking their lives. Thousands and thousands of people were dying uh, in New York City at that time. And yeah, I remember and one it was day, a very difficult like, time. I remember one day during the peak, 799 people just in New York City in one day. In one day. And, 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 and there were communities that were very hard hit. Thank God, the Kala Shul, you know, there was a number of families who had uh, elderly parents that were in, in, in nursing homes or, or not even in nursing homes that were, that, that were taken either due to COVID or maybe some, the fact that there was so little medical attention given to people at that time. So right around, you know, Passover. But um, the members of the shul themselves were, were by and large okay at that time. Maybe it was their parents. Right. Uh, and it was very challenging. I remember talking to members who was like, why couldn't I see my parent when they were dying? Yeah, and it, was, it was a very terrible time. And even the rest of us who weren't uh, dying were still isolated from one another, no community. Our own families were, were not coming to see us if they were. If, if they had to travel and so on. So, um, so one thing I think we should be thinking about when we do the Seder this year 
is is I, I mean I personally have been vaccinated since last year. Right. I will have my children. I'll have some communal elements. It won't be the same as it's been two years ago, but we're we're getting back to something. And and I'm very grateful for that. So I, I think I think you know somebody asked if they don't believe in in, in the in God or the formal story, what is there in, in, in the Savior? I'd say that. I'd say like find where are you in your story? Compare yourself to, to a year like last year or wherever it is, whether you're more in Exodus or more in Egypt and mm -hmm. work through that in your own life. And, and, there, and, and you have a story to tell. You have questions mm -hmm. and, and, and you're looking for meaning. And, and you, know, you don't have to be a big believer to believe that we process things in stories. Yeah, that's how we understand the world. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not analyzing things quite like robots, right? We can use that analytical the analytical tools, but we still tell it in a story. So that's why we start with Misa. We say it's a story, right? We don't just say, you know, you, you got you got to say it. We tell a story. Here, are these people, and and the story about those people, Rabbi Kalushkin, is what I talked about last year. How amazing they were. Yeah, what they lived through. At that time, the loss, the re the, the, the rebellion, they, they lived through their own Egypt. Like yes. Rabbi Akiva, who right. lost all the students. Right. Um, th these were not simple people, and yet they rebuilt Judaism. Yet they did something where they created out of the loss of the temple the bedrock of Judaism that we practice today. Stories have the ability to really enlarge us and to offer us models of how to behave. I'll give you an example of a story. I don't normally speak about it publicly, so I don't want to sound self-aggrandizing, which I really don't. But I know you know it's not such a big crowd of speaking about it. It's a big virtual. Yeah. It's a virtual. It's you and me, but there's a virtual. Okay. They're out there. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Tell okay. Say it, say it, say okay, it. so I'll tell the story. It was a story told about Rabbi Yoshebir Soloveitchik. Now, Rabbi Yoshebir Soloveitchik is the name of the rabbi with whom I studied at Yeshiva University, but he was named in turn for his great grandfather, the father of Chaim. And he was a very noted scholar. And he was once sitting with some of his Talmudim, some of his students, and it was shortly before Passover. And the a man came in and he said, Rabbi, I have a question. Am I allowed to drink milk, four glasses of milk at the Seder? So the rabbi said to him, is there an issue of health? The man said, no, I cannot afford wine for myself and my guests. Oh, I probably didn't have many guests. So according to the story, the rabbi gave the man like 25 rubles and the man left. And the student said to the rabbi, why don't you give him 25 rubles? Uh, four rubles would have been sufficient to buy the wine. He says, don't you understand if he wanted to have milk at the Seder, he had no money for meat. He probably had no money for anything. So I wanted to solve this whole problem. I heard this story and about two weeks later, my wife and I found out that an older woman we knew who was quite poor was suffering terrible back pain. It, this happened to me, but I don't want to told and in my okay. name is having happened to me, but okay, but I started to start tell you man, no choice. Okay. So I remember we were speaking to her and I said, Is there no medication available? She said, even on Medicaid, sometimes they could charge you something extra. Mm -hmm. uh, all we found out was that it was going to cost her an extra sixty dollars to get the medication she needed. And we gave her a thousand dollars. And our reasoning was this, if she was in such terrible pain and didn't have $60 for the medicine, who knows what other things she was probably depriving herself of. And I really am not saying it to say we were the greatest philanthropists, which we are not. But I remember, had I not heard that story, yeah, I would not have thought to do that. I probably would have given her 60 or maybe I would have given her 100 and thought, oh, this is, I did a wonderful deed. That's a rabbi. Right. That's the story that you, you needed to hear that story so that you could know that that's, the rabbi is, 
yes. hearing more than just what is right, obvious. You know what? And so I really learned from that. I'm writing a book now called Moral Imagination. Mm -hmm. And the book will consist, I hope, of about 150 stories. Yeah. And the whole goal of it is, is to affect people's behavior, even if the specific story isn't relevant to, you, no. to that experience. The average one of you is not going to, and certainly non-Jews who read the story, I think, can also be affected, even though obviously the thought of drinking milk at the Seder is utterly irrelevant to them. Nowadays, we've just said a vegan, or, or well, not being a vegetarian. Yeah, right. Uh, but that very thought, and that's the power, that's the power of a story. Mm, beautiful. So we're going to continue on Baruch uh, HaMakom. Okay. Baruch Hu, Baruch So, blessed is the, the Holy One, blessed be He, that gave the Torah to His people Israel. Baruch Hu, Baruch Blessed is He, concerning four children, the Torah speaks of. Echad Chacham, Echad Rasha, Echad Tam, Echad Shenei Leilisha. One is wise, one is wicked, and one is simple, and one doesn't know how to ask. Chacham Omer. What does the wise child say? He asks regarding the nuances of the decrees, the testimonies, the, 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 the variety of mitzvot that God, our God has commanded you. Therefore, explain to him the laws of the Passover offering that he may not eat dessert after the final taste of the offering. The wicked child says, what is this for you? And these are quotes from verses. That's why we extract that there are four from four different verses. And because he or she excluded himself or herself from the community of believers, they denied the basic principles of Judaism, and therefore blunted his teeth and talent is because of this that God did for me when I went out of Egypt. For me, but not for him, had he had been there, he would not have been redeemed. Simple son, that what does he say? What is this? Tell him with a strong hand, did, did God take us out of Egypt from the house of bondage? And the son that's unable to ask, you must initiate the subject for him or her, as it is stated. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of this that God has done to me when I went out of Egypt. So I know you're going to talk a little bit about uh, two thoughts. I have about a wicked this. son. Child, yeah, child. So, uh, two thoughts that occur to me uh, on this. Number one, this makes evident what I don't think was evident 2,000 years ago that each child has to be raised separately. You can't have a cookie cutter mm -hmm. response. By the way, somebody else once pointed out to me these four children could actually be the same child at different stages of life. You know, one who knows not how to ask could be a, a four-year-old kid. Mm. And then the simple one could be a 10-year-old kid. And then you can go through the other stages where people are rebellious. So a few points I want to make is, number one, even the rebellious son, guess what? He showed up at the Seder. Who's better, him or the fifth son who doesn't come to the Seder? And that's why I think almost the uniform attitude today is to probably not answer the son who's called the Russia as if he's a Russia, but to try and address him in some other way. You don't want to totally alienate somebody because that's the last weapon you have. The last weapon you have is who needs you? We can live without you, get out of here because then you've used up your last weapon. My friend Dennis Prager, though, raised a very interesting issue. He said, are these really opposites? In other words, Naftali, for example, mm -hmm. and I've never heard this point made before. What should the opposite? Who's the opposite right now of the bad son? The wise son? The wise. But really, what should it be? It should be yeah, the it good son. It should be good and bad. Yeah, it's, if we're, we're, we're counterpointing. So Dennis made the point Tell that me. as a kid, he, he never, he, it always troubled him. And then as he got older, he came to understand you might even have good instincts, but if you don't have wisdom, you'll end up doing stupid things. 
So in order to be a good person, it's not enough to want to be a good person. You have to also exercise wisdom. Now, we know, for example, that there were many Jews in the 1930s who had repudiated Judaism, and many of whom became communists. And they ended up even during the days of Stalin. And they ended up supporting somebody who was an extremely evil person because they were deluded by the good words. You know, we're going to make a fairer world, reach according to his ability, each according to his need. So goodness requires wisdom as well. And so suddenly it makes sense, you know, because as I, as, and I've never heard anybody make that point. You know, we, all, we always accept it. The first son is the wise son. The next son is the wicked son. But first of all, we know something. We know that not all bad people are stupid, but they might not be wise. You know, at the end of the days, they'll often regret the sort of lives they led. So goodness has to be tempered with wisdom, which is why the rabbis insisted that even if a person was a very good person, he or she needed to study Torah. Otherwise, you'd say, okay, just do the commandments, and that's enough. But this really refines us. Okay. I think we're probably going to have to pick up our Yeah, pace. we'll pick it up a little bit. That's, okay. that's, a, great, that's a great teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then... Um, on on page 30 if you're in the same art school family i got a the uh i got talks about what day of the month that you do the seder specifically when we have the matzah and mara and then we start with something interesting that there's a debate in the talmud how do you it says master beginus messiah we, we start off with something negative and there's a debate between rob and shmuel what's the negative we start off with is it avadim hayinu that we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, which is how we actually did start the Haggadah? Mm -hmm. Or is it about, in the beginning, our forefathers, our ancestors, like the parents of Abraham, were idol worshippers? And, and uh, the, the question, the way it's perhaps to be understood is, what is the, the essence of the Seder? Is it about physical enslavement or spiritual enslavement? Mm -hmm. And the answer is both. You know, right. well, which one do we start with? But we include both, and um, and then we and we go kind of seamlessly in 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 and out of these two themes, and then it talks about um, a promise that was made for us. It's called the covenant of the parts, in which God makes a pact with Abraham that we would be enslaved, but we would uh, not only get out, but the the the, the nation that had had um, judged us would, in, who, who was cruel to us would be judged. And that's another question of why. And we can get to that later. And then what we do is, by the way, I, I forgot to refill our, we, we should have had our cups refilled. Yeah. The, the custom is to pour the other person, but we're, we're not doing all the customs perfectly tonight. I, so now what we would do is we would cover the matzah and lift the cup. And, and some people sing this. He she am the he she am the lava saint of the no, he she am the he she am the lava saint of the no, she love a bad lane of the lava saint of the no, she behold of a daughter of the lane of the lava saint of the Akadash boy of whom I see the other. Which means it, it, the one who has stood by our forefathers and for us is not only has they risen against us, let's say, in the time of Pharaoh to annihilate us, but in every generation they rise up against us and God saves us from their hand. Yes. And then we have a proof text. From Lavan, Arami, although it's not so clear, but the verse seems to indicate that Lavan uh, threatened to, to annihilate uh, his own son in law, daughters, and grandchildren. Strange family dynamic there. Mm -hmm. And right. <laughs> like if you think you've got trouble, <laughs> right. meet dear father in law Lavan. Mm -hmm. Arami of the 
And Arab, and, and this is a, something we say actually when we bring the Bikurim, the first fruits. And Arami in an attempt to destroy my forebear, then he sent it to Egypt, he sojourned there with few people, and there became a nation, great, mighty, and numerous. And then we we explain each one of those phrases, sending to Egypt, that we were compelled to sojourn there. He didn't want to stay there, Jacob, but that's what ended up happening. The story of Joseph and the brothers and the famine. Few people were 70 people, and then we became a nation, we became the distinct there, great and mighty. We had many descendants and numerous. But we were still, as the verse, verses in Ezekiel talk about us as being naked. We, we didn't have character or mitzvot, so to speak. And then God saw us downtrodden in your blood and said, through your blood you shall live, which is probably going on the blood of not just the pain and suffering, but the blood, according to the rabbis, of the Dam Mila and the Dam Pesach, the, 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 the uh, circumcision and the blood of the, uh, I wonder if the if, if people, if there were Christians, I don't want to start off Christians, it's a stupid idea, but if they might have read the biblical text about uh, the blood on the lintel in the doorway, right, in, in the Pesach offering, and just thought we were obsessed with blood. Already in the time of the Talmud, they made it very clear. That was like a one-time thing. First of all, it was the blood, yeah. of, the, the blood of the Paschal lamb, uh, but maybe they associated the lamb with Christian or something because if there, uh, you know, maybe there was something in their. There was faith. only one regard in which you can say that the Torah was obsessed with blood, and that was within the fact of Jews not consuming blood. Yeah, but I, I wonder if somebody read actually, this and, 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 yeah. and missed some somebody with miss not with, with with a little more than this natural, obviously. Right, but because it's so, such a strange libel. Because Jews and blood and short, yeah, it's just a, no, the it Jews doesn't make any sense. The when Jews are trying to, like, yeah, were well, the yeah. first people who outlawed the consumption of blood, yeah, yeah, and actually to a degree that somebody psychologically might say they were obsessed with it. You know, nobody yeah. else has this thing where when you kill an animal, you have to pour salt, you know, you have yeah, to do everything yeah. to remove yeah. all the I mean, blood. Because the, the logic in the blood libel is just like almost like. Perverse. It just doesn't make any sense. It's just like, what the hell? There was an yeah. early, uh, he's like sort of near the time of Zionism, a Jewish writer named the Chada'am, who was sure, by no means sure. traditionally religious, yeah. but he made a very interesting point. He said, it's the general rule when people speak badly of you, if enough people say it, you start to think maybe they're right. So a lot of mm -hmm. Jews started questioning aspects of their Jewishness. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and then along came the blood libel, and much of the world mm -hmm. believed in it, and every Jew knew it was an absolute lie. So mm -hmm. you say to the Jews, so is it possible that the whole world is wrong and you alone are right? Mm -hmm. And a Jew answers, it is possible. The blood yeah. libel yeah. proves it's possible. It's the only positive thing I've ever heard. Yeah, that's a good, that's libel. good. That's good, yeah. yeah. Um, because, yeah, it is, you know, unfortunately, one of the arguments that anti-Semites make is we can't all be wrong. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the answer is yes, you can. You know, like the, 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 the strength in numbers when it comes to hate, unfortunately, just shows us why the story of getting out of Egypt is so relevant. And that, that the whole Dar Vadar, never yeah. generation. And look, I mean, I don't want to make it like the Jews are the only ones that suffer. We can share the suffering, but it's not about suffering. It's about transforming a situation, going, realizing that we that we that we can not only escape servitude, but we can make meaning in our life. And that's something that oh, that's a message we need to share with the world. So um, we did the Hisha Amda and we talked about Laban, and then let's talk a little bit about how things started turning around from the depth of despair. Uh, the, the, the Egyptians, but Yerevo Salam Mitzrayim, the Egyptians did bad to us. They, they, they put hard, imposed hard labor on us. They, they, made, a, they made us look bad, actually. But Yerevo Salam Mitzrayim, the beginning of anti-Semitism, is they said we were bad. Right. And they were able to 
impose these harsh measures on us and not feel guilty about it. And that's what they did in Nazi Germany, La Havdil, and so on. Right. You blame and people. You, first, you, vic, you you demonize a group, and then it's much easier to um, take away their rights. Like it says, let's let's get let's get wise, and maybe there'll be a battle, and they'll they'll join our enemy, and they'll leave they'll fight us and leave us. And they afflicted us, as it says in Exodus, the taskmasters made them build uh, Pisum and Ramses, the treasure cities of Pharaoh, and they made us work hard. I was just watching uh, a documentary in the History Channel about Spartacus, oh, the Thracian uh, gladiator that became a, a leader in a, a slave rebellion against the superpower of the time, Rome. Right. Right. So, so. Um, it's very reminiscent of this concept of the Egyptians saying, we got to be careful, these slaves or these people might rebel and join our enemies. Right. So there is an actual, it happened. Um, right. the, 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 he, in that case, they wanted to enslave them so thoroughly that, that, that they felt they wouldn't have a chance to rebel. Uh -huh. So then it says, Venita Kalashem then we cried out to God, and God, our Father, heard our cry and saw our affliction, our burden, and our oppression. And then we talk about all of these things, what the burden was, what the oppression was, that the crying, the God we call this covenant. I, I just want to go back to the thing we started earlier with the questions, which is we didn't just accept the reality. We questioned it. And it upset us, and we did something about it. We didn't rebel, but internally and maybe vocally, we started mm -hmm. to cry out. And and that that cry was the beginning of something of God mm -hmm. turning towards us, remember, awakening the covenant. There's this concept that we said, "Why is God sleeping?" or "Wake up, God." Right. And and you know, it's it's a metaphor, of course, but it's very real. Meaning, we're in a relationship like a child whose father is not paying attention to them. Mm. The child is saying, Tati, I, I need you for something. And that's what feel it is. We're saying, Tati. Right. That's beautiful. Father, I need you. And that's the beginning of, of the, the gula, so to speak. The mm -hmm. redemption comes out of that. I love that. And that fits in with Manashtana. That's a new way of praying. It's really the original way. Right. But the original way of praying was a very immediate prayer to God and, and almost sometimes we see somebody who prays like that and we think they're childish and they often are you know because they're, they're praying like it's a slot machine and I want my candy, I want my car, I want my I want whatever I want right. but there's something powerful to be said, maybe it has to be more integrated into the depth of who you are, not just slot machine prayer, right? but really like crying out from the thing that's really hurting you most wow, excellent Want to add on or no, no. Okay, so we'll keep going. The Otieno Hashem and Mitzrayim. God took us out with a strong hand, an outstretched arm, with miracles. And, and he took us out not through a, a malach, not through an angel or a star for a messenger, but the Holy One blessed be he and this all, all his glory. As it says, I'll pass through the land of Egypt. That night I'll slay all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the man to beast and upon all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I God, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. I am no angel. I will slay all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I am no seraph. And upon all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am no messenger. I, God, is I am no other. It's a ref well, what it is is we first say lay out the statement and then we just repeat it with like another level. So there's a lot of repetition. It's almost like mantras where you go deep. That's a very good way. Yeah, yeah, that keeps going. It's the same, same thing. The mighty hand, that's your charm. And now it's each one referring to. The pestilence, as stretched arm, is the sword, which, by the way, it's interesting because the sword is a verse in Chronicles. We don't really see that in, in, in Exodus mm -hmm. that, but later in the Chronicles, it says his drawn sword in his hand outstretched over Jerusalem. This idea is these images of God and, and his power and his ability and his vengeance. Right. Talk about, you know, why people like. 
badmouthed us because they saw a God of vengeance. They didn't have the rabbinic softening of that vengeance. I right. didn't see mm-hmm. how we understand it to be a God of love and justice, a God of mercy, right? a God that judges, but also wants to be able to forgive mm-hmm. that we talk about during the high holidays. With awe is the Shekhinah. And then we said, has God ever attempted to take unto himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, miraculous signs and wonders, by war, a mighty hand? With signs and wonders. What, and, and then we say, Dam, Ba'esh, Basim Asham. We pour at each one. Dam, Ba'esh, Basim Asham. You use your pinky. Not anymore with COVID. I know what it touches me anymore. <laughs> um, so, one, one little thing I, I, I noticed here. What did I notice here before? Anything on this? No. Okay, so we'll go on. I used a lot of my good material. Right? No, but that, that's always in the Seder. You, we always have a lot, and then we, and then, then everybody gets hungry. It's like, okay, let's move it. You know, let's move it along. Uh, then we start breaking down these same verses instead of interpreting it to mean two, two, two to a total of ten plagues, and then we do it again. Uh, the ten plagues, we pour out a little bit of each plague. Dam, blood, spardea, frogs, kinim, vermin, death, arrow, wild beast, dever, pestilence, shin, boils, bar, and hail, arba, locust, koshef, darkness, makas, bachoros, plague of the firstborn. Avyuda, you know, Sabahem Simonim, he would abbreviate them into initials. That's uh, Adash, we have to save you wine, but, but we do both. And then we refill the cup, and then Rabbi Yos, then, then we, Rabbi <laughs> Yossi would um, enumerate that just like we had 10 plagues on dry land, we also actually had what he considered 50 at the sea. Rabbi Elazar says that really, each play could be divided into four, so there's a total of 40, and then on the C was uh, 200. Rabbi Kiva has the biggest number, five for each play, right. and a to- and then that, that would be 50, and then five times that, five times that, that two, two uh, 250 at, at the C. Um, In general, though, yes. the rabbinic inclination was to minimize our joy. Mm. At yes. the fall of our enemies. You know, and they always, there's the famous teaching that the angels were singing, and God said, My creatures are drowning, yeah. and they're singing. Yeah. And to which my response has always been, Okay, maybe that's how angels have to act. Yeah. But you can't ask the yeah. Jews who will be human chased. Yeah. What about a human being who's yeah. being chased by somebody yeah. who tries to shoot him? Yeah. And then the person suddenly collapses from a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Can you get angry if the human being sings a song of praise to God? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you got to be fair. It's not like the Egyptians had been terrible to the Jews, yeah. and now they want them to be better. They actually died while trying to murder the Jews. Yeah. They were chasing yeah. after them. So I've always found that Midrashic teaching a little hard to understand, but then I said, okay, so you can say maybe that angels are supposed to act differently. Yeah. But from the perspective of the person whose life was saved at the last minute from being murdered, what are we supposed, you know, what are we supposed to expect from such a if if you don't thank God in praise at that moment, so when do you? Yeah. And let's face it, for, for mo- most of the time that we've been saying this. It, it, it doesn't mean it's not. A, it, no, we're at, we're asking that the retribution is something that comes from God. Nobody's advocating violence here, right, you know, or anything like that. It's very clear. Uh, and 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 once you get into the Kabbalistic interpretation, these things are more have a mystical significance of some form of a revelation, even though it would call it a plague. 
but in fact, it's kind of revealing some aspect of God's providence. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they often talk about how uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, I remember we once had, um, we had a speaker here who gave a talk at one of our days of Kabbalah on Rabbi Soloveitchik's understanding of the, of the purpose of the meetings between Moses and Pharaoh. Right. That, that the point of, of, of those meetings, which included really the, the plagues, yeah. was to go to where Pharaoh was and, and his mindset and his philosophy yeah. and to somehow get into him from that place, start transforming him. And, it, and the plagues were the only ways to be able to do that, basically. For, for Pharaoh to realize the error of, 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 of his philosophy and his lifestyle. It's funny because a book just came out, I'm forgetting the author, I think his name was Gerson, mm. who just wrote a book of inspired discussions about the Seder. And he made a, a little different point there. Under the rubric, how is it worth it to get into political arguments mm. with people who oppose you? And mm. his basic point was it's usually not worth it. And he offers as an example exactly the point you are making. Pharaoh learned nothing. Learned nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look what well, according to the rabbis, eventually he became the king of Ninveh, and then did Chuva once Jonah came. I mean, like it's a crazy okay. like, uh, add on to the story. But I, yeah, I want it's not in the shot at all. Yeah, I want to add on to what Rabbi Tully is saying. I, I'm not familiar with that. It's a Gemara. It's a, it's a medrash. Okay, it's a medrash. And one of the things you should know about medrashim, you are not required. You're fantastical. To this yeah. is one in particular, right? It's right. Like, so in the case of Pharaoh, yeah. you know, all these things happened. And, and the biblical text actually interprets it very differently. Mm -hmm. In the biblical text, when he expels the Jews, he really has learned the lesson and he begs Moses to pray for him. But then by the next day, he's uh, hard. He, yeah. his heart hardens again. Yeah. But what's interesting is you think th this writer who wrote this made an interesting point. You know, we always think of Egypt as this totalitarian society where people probably were afraid to say anything. But I think it's after the seventh plague that they actually, some of his advisors yeah. plead with him. Yeah. He said, don't you see that Egypt is going to be destroyed by yeah. this guy? And and, you know, Pharaoh doesn't order their execution or anything, mm -hmm. but by the end, they willingly, it just shows there's an expression in Hebrew, sinam yeah. tashura. Hatred makes the straight line crooked. And it's true, when you really hate somebody, you you can no longer think this rationally. Yeah. This is true, yeah. Mm. So that will do Dayenu. Okay, Dayenu. How many malos to us the makamaleno? How many the the God has bestowed so many favors and good things upon us? Ilu ilu hotzianu hotzianu mitzrayim mitzrayim hotzianu dayenu day dayenu day dayenu day dayenu 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 day dayenu Die, die, no, die, die, no, die, no, die, no. You lose over him, but you lose over Elohe, him, die, no. You lose over Elohe, and low haragas, the hurry, and die, no. You die, no, die, die, no, 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 die, die, no, die, die, no, 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 Yes. Had he brought us out of Egypt and not executed judgment against the Egyptians, that would have been enough. Had he executed judgment against them, but not upon their gods, it would have been enough. And then I'll oh, we'll skip a little bit. Had he not given us our, their wealth, uh, given us the wealth, but not split the sea for us, it would have been enough. Had he split the sea for us, but not let us through on dry land, it would have been enough. That would have been, we'd have gotten through, but it would have been very muddy. But imagine, of course, the logical question, and we're hardly the first ones to pose it, yes. is if he didn't split the sea for us, yeah. so we'd all have been in vain. Yeah. We would have all died. So what is this really teaching us? It really is teaching us something. 
Gratitude should not be only thought of in terms of the end result. You got to be gratitude, have great every gratitude day. for every step of the way. And that's the secret of starting to lead, I think, a happier life. Yeah. You know, there's a beautiful story, and I, I only understand it maybe now with the last Ishpitzer on Zina Rebbe. Yeah. He was somewhere in Poland, and the, and the Nazis came there very late. And they rounded them up. And then the day that they took them to the Auschwitz or whatever camp it was where they murdered them, you know, when they murdered them, was a perfectly beautiful blue day. And the, maybe one person survived in that group. And the Rebbe looked up at the sky with the rest of them around and he said, what a beautiful day. I never understood it because, I mean, that was maybe his last day, the day before his last day. Yeah, was what terrible. does that mean? Was it the worst day, worst day? But I think maybe he meant that at that moment, he didn't let the Nazis ruin the beauty of that moment. Hmm. That day, it was just a blue sky, perfect. He didn't let the Nazis make that God's world is a bad world. We all know that it was a bad world at that point. It was a terrible world. It was a terrible year, a terrible period in history, the darkest, the worst. But maybe that is one interpretation of Dayeno that, that he, if I just had that moment of that day, even if he didn't live beyond, I'm not on this level. That's why I can't understand. That's why it took me so many years to, to not understand this story. You know? Or if you know. lose somebody yeah. at a very, very young age, you have to try and cultivate a recollection of the very many wonderful things you had from that person mm. in their shortened life. And, and if they had not lived at all, you would not have had. Yeah, and you struggle because it doesn't come easily. But the rabbis in the Dayenu are recognizing that the human tendency is not so easily to be grateful. But if you understand life as having a tragic dimension to it, as well as a good dimension, anything good, you want to try and cultivate uh, the feeling of gratitude. And you can't in the case of a death of a young person. You can't simple-mindedly go around thinking like that all the time. But you want to ultimately be able to reach something like that because otherwise you will go mad. Mm -hmm. And I think the story, I find it hard to accept the story you just told about Based the last on, yeah. of the yeah. Ishpitzer. But I understand what he was trying to do. He didn't want the Nazis to succeed in taking away all of his faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can cultivate gratitude. And the important thing about gratitude is gratitude is the prerequisite trait also for happiness. Mm -hmm. Think of people you know of who are ungrateful people. They are not otherwise happy people because the world that they inhabit, people who are not grateful live in a world where they don't think anybody's grateful. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it can't be a happy world. They think that if somebody did something for them, oh, they had some cynical motive for it. Or somebody else, oh, now he's helping me, now he's gonna want me to help them. So when you live in a world where everybody only does things for selfish reasons, it's really hard to cultivate love for right. anybody. Yeah. But if you recognize that they really are good people and people who want to help other people, uh, so you start to like people more. And you recognize that there are people who do good things for you just because they're good people. So the whole world becomes a happier world. Ungrateful people are unpleasant to be around, but they are ultimately unpleasant for themselves. themselves yeah. So that's what I think this song is about. Mm -hmm. Diana. At every step of the way, for every good thing that happens in our life, we're going to cultivate a, great, a grateful response. Yes, well. Well. I think what we should do is, is maybe just go into the describing the various yeah. things we're going to yeah. soon be eating. So, so one last thing we're pretty much up to. It says, Rabbi Gamliel would say, you need to mention these three things. Pesach, Matzah, and the Mara. Pesach is, the, is what they would bring in the time of the temple. 
the matzah you're actually supposed to lift up the middle matzah mm -hmm. and you're supposed to say this was because there wasn't enough time for dough of our ancestors to rise before God himself revealed to them in, in during the exodus and then we put that down and lift up the mar and say we we remember how our lives were embittered with the harsh backbreaking labor Mm -hmm. And then we say the whole point that we bring it all home in every generation. We have to see and show ourselves as if we left Egypt. And not just that it was a revelation or a redemption for our ancestors, but for us as well. And we make a blessing on, on the redemption. And then we say, uh, because of that, we get to the hallow that comes from the darkness to light. For me, it's very important this year the importance of God took us out of Egypt compared to last year. Meaning mm. was, even if we're not completely out, we're on the way out. Last year when we felt like we were still in we the midst still of the slavery. depth of this darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Minitsram Gaeltano, you know, just to feel the realness of the coming out of if right. you felt something last year and you're not grateful and you're not coming out of it, you're you're like you like you just talked about so beautifully and passionately, then you're you're going to be miserable, you know, right. like you, you know, and you're not going to really get out of Egypt in that way. And that's what we say, the hollow, we say some form of the hollow here. And then we make that blessing, we'll lift the cup up, we'll say it without Hashem's name, but we will say that I've got some with Hashem's name. Okay. And then we'll recline. Uh, the master's cover for this. we recline on our left side. Right. It's a real saving. No, I know. I got a grape juice on my shirt. Oh, <laughs> true. You can still pour on. It's a sign of a Seder. You're covered in matzah. And more and wine, yes. you know, your shirt is uh, testifying something. Right. That's funny. And then we go wash our hands. Um, I think Devara usually actually says she brings, she makes sure they bring to us the the washing of the hands that we don't have to get up. So right. Consider it of your Robinson to do that. Um, and then we take the two matzah, the, the two and a half matzahs. And we make a bracha. Um, and, and the first one is because matzah is food like any food, so it's baruch atashem like in Malka Olam. Amotzi lechem in Then we put down the bottom matzah and make the special bracha for the mitzvah. Baruch atashem, again with God's name. Elokeinu melech, baruch atashem, elokeinu melech olam, asher kidushon memsos of etzivano, al achilat matzah. Amen. And then we take the matzah and we recline on our left side and we eat about half of a shmora matzah. And in this shul, it's very beautiful because everybody knows we were taught that eating in the matzah is an eating meditation. Mm. I know there's a lot of different types of Easter meditations, but our meditation is to eat, is to, eat, is to really have kavana that we are kind of bringing up the matzah and the matzah is bringing us up. And let me tell you, it's really special. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, and then and then so you take a few minutes just to eat it and to taste it and realize just that the eating itself and everything in it, all the stuff that we just read about, and and matzah being the humility and about the freedom and 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 the spirit, the spirituality and, and, and the revelation of God that the matzah symbolizes mm -hmm. in Exodus, all goes into your taste, into your mouth, into your stomach, and who you are. The Zohar calls it Michla de Menusa. It's like medicine. That gives that inspires and gives wow. us belief. And then we eat the mar. So um, dip it a little to harosa. So 
I do, uh, I mentioned before, I do horseradish, but I do both. I, that's what I do. I, I, I put some of the horseradish into the romaine lettuce, and then I dip it into the haroset, and then I make a, we make a bracha, baruch atah Hashem alakin amelech haolam, asher kedishanam mesosa v'tzivanu al achilat marar. You don't recline. Okay. Thank you. You don't recline for that because it's a bit of reclining is a sign of luxury. The mara is a symbol of affliction. And then we do the korech, which is known as the Hillel sandwich. We take matzah, we put inside the matzah, the mara, the romaine lettuce, the horseradish. We dip that into a little bit of uh, haroset to sweeten it a little bit. Right. Actually, in the Talmudic times, it, it, it had another purpose then as well. It somehow uh, it was some something on the on the uh, lettuce that the more the 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 pungency of the uh, haroset would get rid of it or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then of course it has something. I told it already mentions the other reasons like the that it's the mortar and so on yes, and so that's forth. Right. But that's yeah. also in the Talmud. But there's yeah. some other reason that doesn't really make sense for us today so much. But mm -hmm. uh, then. Then we, we uh, somebody asked me today when we have the egg. That's when we have the egg. Right. Right after the mar, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the egg is symbolized. So the egg is the chagi, is most people say it symbolizes the chagiga. There's a, another offering that was brought on the major holidays, Passover, mm -hmm. Shavuot. And we also would bring it on, 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 on Passover. And they would actually often eat it so that they would uh, not just have to eat mm -hmm. the. They paid the, the Pesach offering alone, meaning without having something in their stomach ready. Right. And we dip it in salt water, and then they serve uh, dinner. And and um, and then after dinner, the last thing we do is we have the afikomen, and then we pour the third cup, and some people actually cup, pour the cup of Elijah. Right. And then we do the blessing, the grace after meals, the Bechamazon. And then the traditional songs. And then we do that. The, we open up the door for Elijah. It's mm, a, we, right. Right, a, a, after the third cup is drunk, we do the Seshua Then we conclude the hollow. And then we do the songs. Right. Uh, actually, the last thing we do after the hollow and Nishmas is the fourth cup, and then we say Nirza, Fasel, Sidr, Pesach, Fasel. We say it's not included in the Torah accordance with all the laws. And then we do Lashana, Haba, Bi, Rishalayim, Lashana, Haba, Bi, Rishalayim, Lashana, Haba, Bi, Rishalayim, Lashana, Haba, Bi, Rishalayim, 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 the model seder. The model seder. Now, thank you, Rabbi Tolish and Joseph, for thank you. joining us. Good enough, Tully. Doing this for everyone who joined in. Thank you, everyone, for your for joining in with us. And I'll just do. I'll end it with uh, Adia, who we didn't do any nigunim really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did the sing songs. Bim heya, 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 bim heya,